as otherwise Christ be see, but on the occasion of Independence Day when our minds are on liberty and freedom, I thought a uh, detour by 1 Peter would be in order. So please take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, hear from God's Word once again. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the King. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but this, the Word of our God, stands forever. A few years ago, I was in St. Louis, uh, my first visit there. Some of you, a couple I know, have just returned from St. Louis this week. It was the site of our denomination's annual convention, the General Assembly meeting in St. Louis. Uh, When I was there, of course, everybody has to see the Gateway Arch. And uh, I I don't know anything about engineering, I don't know anything about architecture, but I tell you I knew enough to be impressed uh, with St. Louis's Gateway Arch. 630 feet high, 630 feet wide at the base, taking the shape of an inverted catenary curve, so I read. That is the shape the curve that a heavy chain would take if it were suspended at both ends and left to hang free. Each leg is built as a quadrilateral triangle, and the whole thing is made up of 142 sections, each section of which is also a triangle. This thing was conceived and constructed in stainless steel by an architect, Eero Saarinen. Must have been a great architect, wouldn't you think? An engineer as well, perhaps. It's kind of interesting that this architect had perfect freedom to design any form that he wanted to design for the arch in St. Louis or for any other monument that he might be erecting, might be designing. And yet, With that freedom to design, he still was bound by certain laws, by certain mathematical formulas, by certain basic principles. And so the St. Louis Arch, as magnificent in design as it is, able to withstand enormous wind forces, even an earthquake, they say, as glorious as it is, it must still submit to the lowly plumb bob and to the carpenter's square. It still must submit to the basic principles of mathematics. And how many calculations mathematical went into the building of this first of a kind structure? It would be simply staggering. I couldn't comprehend them. I don't know engineering, I don't know architecture, I don't know much about math either. You're realizing your pastor is reasonably ignorant in many, many areas. But the workers put these tremendous triangles together one by one, building from both ends of the arch simultaneously. And they went up and up and up, bringing them finally to meet in the middle at the top with no other support than the triangles themselves. There is no inner structure, no inner frame. It had to be precise. A mistake of one sixty-fourth of an inch at the base would have meant disaster at the top. And that's a good illustration for my subject today, which is the freedom 
found in submission. There is no freedom. What is my thesis? What's my bottom line? What's the sermon in a sentence? There's no freedom apart from submission to God. It's what Dr. Edmund Clowney, former president of Westminster Theological Seminary, once called a strange liberty. A strange liberty. We're observing Independence Day today. Liberty is on our minds. It's all about liberty. Freedom. What a wonderful word. But how loosely is that word thrown about? How many really know what freedom is? On this long holiday weekend, many of our family, friends, uh, they're traveling across the country. We have a great network of highways, interstates, freeways to go and come the great length of our nation. And travel is made infinitely easier because of that. We have freedom of travel. But there would be no freedom for anybody to travel on those highways, those interstates, if certain laws weren't obeyed, at least fundamentally obeyed. You can't travel at any speed, contrary to what some drivers out there seem to think. You can't travel in any direction. You can't travel in any lane on that freeway. You have to obey certain laws. And only if those certain laws are obeyed do we have the freedom for travel. Apply the principle to airline travel. Great freedom. Apply the principle to space travel. Greater freedom. But certain laws are necessary. And so in our text today we're commanded, live as free men. But in the same passage we're told, submit yourselves to every authority instituted among men. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. That's a strange liberty. A strange liberty indeed. Ask the guy on the street, the average Joe, what is freedom? And he probably would say something like, it's being able to do anything you want to do whenever you want to do it. And not having to do anything you don't want to do at any time you don't want to do it. You may have come up with that definition yourself in the beginning of this sermon, I hope not at the end. There's no freedom without submission to God. Elizabeth Elliot has written about a friend of hers, a woman who's a very wise mother, apparently. She had a Uh, an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old boys in the home. And one day she went to wake up one of her boys and he said, "Um, I'm not going to get up today. She said, oh, son, are you sick? Are you feeling bad? He said, no, I feel fine. It's just today's going to be a free day. And I'm not going to do anything I don't want to do. And I'm going to do everything that I want to do. And I just don't want to get up. And she said, oh, well, He said, do you think that kind of rule would be good for the whole family to apply? He said, well, sure, sure. And she said, okay, well, I don't know how it'll go, but we'll try it. And so she left him alone, and about 11.30 he came staggering out of the bedroom, sleepy-eyed, looking for his breakfast. Where's my breakfast? She said, breakfast? He said, didn't you make me breakfast? And she said, oh, no. said, you know, today's a free day. I I didn't want to make breakfast. Oh. So he found his Cheerios in the cupboard and managed to get his own breakfast. But while he was eating, he looked out the window and saw his brother leaving the garage riding on his bicycle. And he said, wait, you can't ride that. That's my bicycle. And the brother said, oh, well, it's a free day. And I can do anything I want to do. And don't have to do anything I don't want to do. And so the day went through and through the hours. And by supper, needless to say, it was not necessary for mom or dad to preach any sermon to either of their boys about what freedom is. Freedom is not doing what you want to do or not doing what you don't want to do. Freedom requires submission to certain rules, certain regulations, certain limitations and laws. So what we've come to then is this paradox, the paradox of freedom. Freedom occurs only in connection with limitation. Freedom occurs only in connection with limitation. Who would be an athlete? Who would be willing to find the freedom that those athletes find exercising their bodies, performing their great feats of skill, stamina, endurance, if they didn't discipline themselves in the gym? 
if they didn't discipline themselves on the track, living with certain limitations, what to eat, what not to eat, when to sleep, when to work out. In order to find the freedom, there must be limitation. Who is free to mount the, the, the pole vault to the highest level? Who's free to run the swiftest race? The one who best submits. The one who best submits to the necessary laws and limitations. Just ask Shikari Richardson. Suspended for a month, her Olympics aims apparently thwarted, well, at least in great jeopardy, because she thought she wasn't subject to the rules. A little marijuana in training, not against the law in the state, but against the law of the Olympics Committee, and she's set aside. She may lose her chance at 21 years of age. And so it is in the spiritual realm. Freedom occurs only in connection with limitation. And we've not advanced very far in our spiritual lives if we've not come to realize that, if we've not seen the truth of that principle. Aristotle once said, all men seek happiness. Aristotle, a great thinker, all men seek happiness. There are no exceptions. Would you agree? I can't think of any exceptions. Perhaps he's right. Everybody wants happiness. The difference among us is in where we look for it, in where we look for that happiness, where we seek it. Pop singer Elton John on his farewell tour, he'll be in Charlotte according to the schedule next year for one of those concerts, quoted in a German magazine, I am gay and would not want to be heterosexual for all the money in the world. I've got enough money, don't have to follow any rules, don't have to be in the office from nine to five or take the kids to school in the morning. It's simply a fantastic life when you don't have any parameters. It's brilliant. Here's a quote from another German source, poet, dramatist, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He wrote, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. God's truth, not our desire, is what points the way to freedom. It is God's truth that directs us to freedom, not the desire of our own sinful hearts. You'll know the truth, Scripture says, and the truth will set you free. God's truth will set you free. And the tr truth, what is the truth? The truth is that we were made, how does the catechism go? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's the truth. We were made to find what I call soul rest. You know what I'm getting at, what I'm pointing to? Soul rest in eternal fellowship with God. And homosexuality or gossip or greed or gluttony or drunkenness or slander or any other sin unrepented of will threaten our souls on an eternal scale. They are condemning. They are limiting to the ultimate degree. They bind us to Satan and they threaten to imprison us in hell forever. But we were trying to speak of man's search for happiness. I've gone off to a rather dark sideline. Freedom. Happiness for man. Jesus has given us the formula for freedom. Jesus has given us the formula for happiness. He said, if you lose your life for his sake, you'll find your true self. If you lose your life for his sake, he says, then you're going to discover your true self, who you really are. If you give up your hourly, daily clamoring for satisfaction in the here and now, you will find ultimate satisfaction in the beyond. He said, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Paradox, 
like so much of God's truth. Truths that are brought together in tension, seeming to be contradictory, but in God's wisdom, give us the whole picture. The way to find your life is to lose it. The way to become the greatest is to become the least. The way to discover true freedom is to observe the limitations of God's law. Christians are able to submit to God's law precisely because they're Christians. Peter has just reminded his audience, those who are reading his letter, of who they are. Chapter 2, verse 9, he says, you are a chosen people. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Friends, when you know who you are, when you know what you have been sent to do, when you know those things, then you'll be able to know your true calling and to follow that calling in freedom. It worked that way for Jesus. Knowing who He was, He knew who He was. Knowing what He was sent to do, He knew what His assignment was. Knowing those things, Jesus could submit Himself to God's law in the first instance, the lawgiver putting himself under the law he gave, could submit himself to people, sinful people. That's all there was, after all. Could come as one who was not to be ministered to, although deserving of all ministry and honor and glory, but coming as one who was to minister to others, to give his life as a ransom for many, as the testimony of Scripture is. Who has ever possessed greater freedom inherent in His person than the eternal Son of God. But He's shown us that the proper use of that freedom is submission, is obedience. Submission and obedience which meant first service to God, but which also in the second analysis meant service to man. And so the Apostle Peter urges us here in our key verses 16 and 17, live as free men. But do not use your freedom as an excuse, a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the King. So in our text today, Peter's describing freedom in service, which is directed three ways. It's directed, first of all, to God, service to God. It's directed to the church, service to the church. And it's directed to the world, service to the world. Peter describes here that we are to live as free men with servanthood toward God in view. We are servants of God. You know, we'd find it so much easier to function as servants of God, to function as true disciples of Jesus Christ, if we could just remember just this one thing that we are here as aliens on this earth. We are strangers in this world, verse 11. We are to live here as transients, people that are just passing through. And as such, in that role, with that identity, we are to abstain from sinful desires. The verb here, to abstain, fits our status as strangers in this world perfectly. The idea behind this is that a person distance himself, distance herself from from these evil desires, from fleshly lusts. To, To recognize some distance should be maintained between us and those things. So, a temporary resident in a foreign land doesn't find find it hard to distance himself or distance herself from the lifestyle that he finds there. A temporary resident who recognizes the temporary nature of his presence there is not likely to seek to absorb all of the uh, in, distinctives of that, of that culture, to adopt the customs of that land. He's not there to live, he's just there for a visit. He doesn't pick up the values, he doesn't adopt the lifestyle of that place. And because he's different, people notice and they conclude ultimately, you're not from around here, are you? You're not, you're not from around here. And so I may visit the Bronx. Don't know why, but I may. But when I get there, I don't feel the necessity to start saying, you guys. I may go to Pennsylvania on a vacation, but I'm just there temporarily. I do not feel the necessity to learn how to eat scrapple. I'm free from the necessity of all that. I can distance myself from those things Because after all, I'm just passing through. 
I'm a stranger. I'm an alien there. Peter wants his readers to remember that their citizenship is in heaven. Friends, if you're a believer or follower of Jesus Christ, your citizenship is in heaven. It is not in Huntersville. It is not in the United States. It is not in planet Earth. It is in heaven. In the most profound way, you're not from around here. That would make a world of difference in our willingness to submit to the requirements that God has for His people. We're seeking to accommodate ourselves to this culture, to live here, to be at peace here, to act as though this world is our forever home. We're just passing through. So this ties in very directly with the preceding section in which he's reminded these Christian pilgrims Peter has that they are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Therefore, because of that reality, you're not to conform to the wicked conduct of your neighbors. Instead, what are you to do in the, in the view, in the, in the, in the uh, observation of your neighbors? You're to live such good lives, such righteous lives that they'll have no choice but to recognize the difference. Yeah, you're not from around here, I can tell. And they'll be brought to shame for their own wrongdoings. And they'll be forced to glorify God. And so when Christians distance themselves from sinful desires, from those fleshly lusts, which one translation says, which war against their souls, when they do that, when we can do that, then we're free to serve God. Live as free men. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Listen, liberty, which is real, is not to be used as license. Liberty, which is real, is not, nevertheless, any kind of excuse for doing wrong. So Peter warns against any abuse of Christian freedom. The freedom which we have in Christ is real freedom. And as real freedom, it occurs only, what? In connection with limitations. And so this real freedom we have frees us from something, but it also frees us for something. It frees us from bondage to sin, and it frees us for service to God. Christians are free from bondage to sin. Christians weren't, once were slaves. You weren't always a Christian, by the way. You and everyone else in this world once was, or perhaps still is, a slave of Satan, a slave of the devil, in bondage to sin. Going the devil's way, going the sinful way was the only option you had. It was the only thing that you could do given your fallen sinful nature, your total depravity, touched in every part of your body by the effects of sin. But Christians now, in the conversion, in the rebirth, in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they have a new way open to them. It's not necessarily that old way, but there's a new way now. They're free to live as servants. A servants, yes, not of Satan, though but servants of God. We are free, but we are free to serve and obey God. I've quoted Aristotle. I've quoted the guy with the big glasses. Can I quote Bob Dylan? (laughs) Everybody's got to serve somebody. An obscure reference for most of you youngsters, but the older heads will perhaps register with it. Here's one you can all register with. I had it printed on the front of your bulletin because it was so helpful, I thought. Dr. Frank Barker, the founder of Briarwood Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, has put it very helpfully in his uh, study, his uh, commentary on 1 Peter, when he wrote this, freedom is not just being able to do what we want to do. True freedom is wanting to do and being able to do what we ought to do. So we may not, must not use our new freedom as a cover-up for evil. We can become very adept. Oh, we're slick and oily sometimes. We can become very adept at spiritualizing our disobedience. We can become very proficient at throwing spiritual disguises over our sin, trying to dress even the sins up to make them look presentable in God's sight. A great illustration from the Old Testament is King Saul when he disobeyed God. God had instructed this first king of Israel to go and destroy the Amalekites, wipe them out from the face of the earth, man and animal. But when Saul and his army got there, they saw that some of those animals looked pretty good like choice livestock. They had no trouble killing the puny ones, but some of these good ones, we'll we'll save them. And so they did. 
And God confronted him. Why have you disobeyed me? He said, oh, well, Lord, I was just thinking these good-looking cows, these good-looking sheep would make a really fine offering to you. And God saw through it immediately, saw through the false piety all the way to the covetous greed which really lay behind it. And God said, I am grieved that I ever made Saul king over Israel because he has turned away from me and has not obeyed my commands. Our freedom is real, but it is never our freedom to disobey God. Jesus said, you want to be my disciple? You want to show yourself to be my disciple? He said, if you hold to my teaching, if you hold to my teaching, I read into that obey, obey. If you hold to my teaching, then you are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so Peter draws a radical conclusion. Christians who would live as servants of God in this world must be willing to live in submission to others. We're free to serve God. We're also free to serve the church. He says, love the brotherhood of believers. Notice he doesn't just say love the brothers. He says the brotherhood. And that's the whole bunch. That's the entire community, the entire fellowship, the whole body. Christ has joined believers together for a purpose, has joined us together as a congregation for a purpose, has joined the PCA together for a purpose as a denomination, has joined the Christian church together for a purpose, and that purpose is to extend His kingdom, to promote His kingdom, and to do whatever comes to hand to make that kingdom grow, and for Him to be acknowledged as the Lord and the King of all. And to do that, we come together and we work together, we minister together. The Lord has not intended that there be isolated Christians, no Lone Ranger Christians allowed. We're to show our love for Christ and our submission to Christ, who's the head of the church, by becoming part of a local congregation, the local, in our neighborhood, representation of the body of Christ. We're to refuse this forsaking of ourselves together, which some apparently were engaging in. It is for the church that Christ died. It is the church which Christ has identified as His bride. It is the church which Jesus Christ Himself is building and against which the gates of hell will not prevail. It is the church which Jesus is coming again to reclaim. And so we support the worship and the work of the church by sharing in its life, by sharing in its ministry, by giving of our time, giving of our talent, giving of our gifts to become a minister. Every member a minister. Not simply to be ministered to, but to look for ways to minister to others. And this loving service is not for the local congregation only, but it is for the whole world, the church around the world. Because in our freedom to serve God, we also serve the church. And we also serve the world. Verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority, every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. (sighs) Difficult? Oh, yes it is. Perhaps you're a Republican suffering through a Democratic administration. Perhaps you're a never-Trumper who suffered the previous four years under the previous administration. It's difficult. But it is not a difficulty lost on the author. Peter was not naive to these dynamics. Remember when Peter was writing, who was on the throne? Who was the emperor of Rome? It was Nero who brought the harshest persecution the Christian church had known up to that point. It was shortly after, Peter wrote shortly after the Lord Jesus himself had submitted himself to a governor whose name was, what was it, Pontius Pilate? Something like that. Getting behind the English translation helps us with this this admittedly difficult concept of the obligation to submit to earthly authorities. Peter is not actually calling on us to submit to institutions. He's calling on us to submit to the people who are in authority. The language here really calls us to be subject to every human creature. Creatures are created. And human creatures are created in the image of God. And that's why we're to show proper respect to everyone. 
as verse 17 requires. We should recognize them as God's creatures made in His image. It may be a distorted image as it very obviously is in so many cases, in every case to some degree. But His image is never extinguished. It may be marred, it may be defaced, but it is never extinguished. We're to give due honor, due respect to all image bearers. And so for the Lord's sake, for our fellow Christians' sake, for the world's sake, we have to be, we, you and I, have to be ready to submit to others. I was reading the news yesterday, the people that were arrested up in Maine, you know, on the interstate, they said, uh, we can carry these guns. We don't have to have license. We don't have to have driver's licenses. Uh, we don't submit to the, to, to the United States authority over us. We, we have no responsibility to the U.S. We're a sovereign nation. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't get it. You've got to submit. Everybody's got to serve somebody, Bob Dylan. And so we submit ourselves for the world's sake to good deeds which will make us witnesses to the world. We must submit ourselves to fellow Christians out of sacrificial love for them. We submit ourselves for God's sake because we honor His image in our fellow creatures and because we respect, here's another thing, because we respect His sovereign ordering of our lives. How did that democratic president get to be president? Apart from God's will? How did that Republican president get to be president? Apart from God's will? Or that governor? Or that county commissioner? Or that chief of police? Or that boss in the place you work. God's sovereign ordering of our lives must be recognized. But we submit especially because we're grateful for the one who took up the cross to submit. Who did all this before us. Talk about submission. Who's ever submitted more fully than he? He he did it for us. And it is precisely in this submission, in that locus, in that position that we find our freedom, that we find our greatest liberty, our only real liberty, a strange liberty though it is. The eternal Son of God submitted Himself to the limitations of a human body in the beginning. The eternal Son of God taking upon Himself flesh. Jesus Christ, the freest man that ever lived, submitting Himself to the law of God. And our Lord in His sinless perfection submitted Himself to judgment by sinners and execution as a criminal. And He did it that anyone who would walk in faith and obedience as His disciple, anyone who would walk in faith and obedience uh, as His disciple might become truly free. That's where your freedom lies. And in the Lord's Supper, we remember the cost of that freedom. And so we invite to the table all those who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have committed themselves, heart and soul, to walk in obedience to Him and in faith before Him. That is, who's truly a Christian. It's not necessary that you be a member of this congregation or even this denomination to participate in the supper here as we serve it. If you're trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, if you're truly repentant and seek to walk in newness of life, you're encouraged to come and to participate. If you are also a member in good standing of any evangelical church. Why that? Because we're talking about the authority of Christ and about submission to the authority of Christ. And how is the authority of Christ exercised, demonstrated on the earth? It is through the local church. And so you put yourself under His authority, you recognize His claim to your obedience by being a member of His church. So, a true believer, a member of an evangelical church, you're invited to come. We do not include our youngest children until they've had opportunity to express their faith to the session and be received as communing members of the church. We warn unrepentant sinners to be cautious in coming lest you eat judgment to yourself in your unrepentant condition. That is, Refusing to repent of known sin. I always want to clarify because our sins are so subtle and so numerous, we're guilty and we don't even know it sometimes. Such is the darkness of our minds. But all known sin, you repent of it. And there's no better time than now. And then when you're ready to come, 
we'll serve the elements in our customary way. We've adopted it during the COVID time, but we like it. And so we're sticking with it for a while for you to come at your own pace and uh, to receive the elements from the table and then come and uh, take your seats again. And we'll eat and drink uh, together when I, when I give you the signal. And then children, if you want to bring your youngest children to receive a blessing from the pastor so they won't feel unnecessarily left out, uh, we'll be very glad to pronounce a blessing over them. Here's how it all began. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same way, after supper, He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of Me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until He comes.